This morning's gospel reading is found in the 10th chapter of the writings of Mark. It begins with the 19th verse. I believe it is found on page 46 of your pew Bible. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Then Jesus went on to say, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. The man said to him, Jesus, I have kept all these things since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have a treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and he went away grieving for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed by these words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for the, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. As I start this morning, I would like to deal with that last part first because I think that is the most difficult. It is for me because I know that in comparison to the rest of the world, I am a wealthy person. And I think you are as well. So what do we do about this statement? It will be easier for a rich man, or rather for a camel, to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. Here's what I think it is. First of all, Jesus follows that immediately by saying, with humans, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I really think what he might be saying is that you're lost. There's no way. But I'm about to give my life for you. And then all things are possible. Isn't that the way it is? We're lost. I mean, every day of my life, I fall short. It's only through the grace of God that I can be saved. It's simple. Having said that, I bring you greetings. It has been some time since Linda and I were able to enjoy Good Shepherd, the Bismarck Mandan area. As Craig mentioned, I was on the Senate staff for a number of years, and then I served as senior pastor at First Lutheran. And there we discovered we had a great church. And this has been a great church. I have known this, this church over many years. And the thing that I have always known about Good Shepherd is that you are a mission congregation. One time Jesus was asked, which is the greatest commandment? They were trying to trick him. And he said, well, the first. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That young rich man said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? If we ask that question today, what is the answer? The answer is nothing. Christ has done it for you. 
He gave his life for you. And if you don't believe there's a hell, there is one. But Christ has saved you from that damnation. So now the, be question, the question becomes, what do we do in response to what Christ has done for us? And that's why we gather here on this day and all the times that we come into this church. We come in here to respond to what Christ has done for us. And then when we leave this place, we go out into the world again to respond to what Christ has done for us. I'm afraid that oftentimes our possessions possess us. It's true with me. Linda and I have moved another a number of times because of my profession. And every time we have this huge garage sale of all of this stuff we didn't even know that we had. George Carlin once put it very well. And this is probably the only thing I'll say from George Carlin. <laughs> He said our stuff possesses us. You know, we start out our marriages and we live in a mobile home or an apartment, but we get so much stuff that we have to buy a house. And then we start accumulating more stuff. And pretty soon we have to buy a bigger house for all of our stuff. And then we fill that house and pretty soon our garage is full and we're parking outside. And then we build another garage. And then we rent a storage space. I mean, isn't it true? We just accumulate stuff. When we go to a mall or a store of any kind, do we any longer buy necessities? I mean, oftentimes I go to a place and I come out with nothing I ever imagined even seeing there. And sometimes I have to ask myself the question, what if I had not bought that? And what if I had taken that money and given it to the mission of Christ? What if I had given that money to world hunger instead of something selfishly for myself? I read a story not too long ago. It was about a diamond expert. He's flying from New York to Los Angeles. As he boards the plane, comes to his seat, he sees a woman sitting there with this gigantic diamond on her finger. He starts a conversation. He said, that's what I do for, as my life giving. I evaluate diamonds, and I don't know, think I've ever seen one like that. She said, oh, well, it's the Klopman diamond. But it comes with a curse. He said, well, what is the curse? She said, Mr. Klopman. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we're so anxious to accumulate wealth that we get into places that we don't want to be. You know, today, if 50 747 jets full of kids under the age of six were to crash and all of those kids were to die, it would make media throughout the world of all kinds. Yet, my friends, today, that number, 25,000 kids under the age of six are going to starve to death. And it's going to happen tomorrow. And the day after that, and the day after that, 365 days a year. 20 years ago, it was 40,000. We're doing better, but we can do so much better. This church, 
is one of the places that stands up and is counted. You have been the leading mission church in this synod for many years, and I'm sure you will continue to be. Do you know that last year the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which is your, the body that is the next tier, gave $20 million to world hunger, another $15 million to the malaria campaign, 90% of any gift that goes there, more than 90%, gets to its destination. No other benevolent organization in the world can say that. And if this church gives to world hunger or gives to disaster response, 100% of your money gets to where it's going and their feet are on the ground the next day. I remember back a number of years ago when I was serving at First Lutheran in Mandan, Hurricane Katrina. Disaster of the worst kind and everybody was wondering, what can we do? And the leaders of Good Shepherd and First Lutheran got together. And they said, we're going to make a difference. And so we started to meet and formulate a plan. And that plan was that on a particular evening, we would have a fundraiser with silent auctions and live auctions and all of these things. Two spokespeople. Ed Schaefer and Heidi Heitkamp. And they didn't care that one was a Republican and one was a Democrat. Because they were uniting their hearts to help other people. On that night, we raised $60,000. We made a difference in lives in that area. In fact, we even adopted a suburb of that area that these churches continued to care for long after that time. That's who you are. And what a blessing that is for the church and for the world. But it comes at a cost. The cost is your generosity. This congregation has been willing to share its resources so that others might live better. And that's one of the reasons we gather today. Later in this service, there will be a commitment. And you will ask, be asked to prayerfully consider what God has shared with you and what you will share back. There's no pressure because nobody but the financial secretary will ever know what you wrote on that card or didn't write on that card. It's completely between you and your maker. I want you for a moment to just let your mind wander with me. This is something that has already happened, but it could happen every day. Imagine that in Africa, there's a little girl that's sleeping safely under a mosquito net that will save her life. That mosquito net was purchased from a youth group in North Dakota. That young girl will grow up to be a doctor and she will save thousands of lives, all because of the generosity of those young people. For a small amount on our part, we change lives. And that's what God calls us to do. Somewhere out there are people whom God has called you to make a difference in their lives. And somewhere out there are people who will change your life as you make a difference in theirs. Somewhere out there are people for whom Christ died, for whom this church was built, and for whom you are called to love. You have been blessed, and you have been a blessing to others. And on this day, we ask you to prayerfully consider what God has shared with you 
and what you need to share with God for God's work. God bless you all. Amen.